Hi everybody, this is my audiobook reading of the collected works of Podrick H. Pierce, Political Writings and Speeches. I'll be recording and releasing it one chapter at a time, and then when the whole volume is complete, I'll put it together and put it on YouTube. This instalment contains four short essays grouped together because they're too short to release individually. Collected Works of Podrick H. Pierce, Political Writings and Speeches Chapter 3, The Coming Revolution November 1913. I have come to the conclusion that the Gaelic League, as the Gaelic League, is a spent force, and I am glad of it. I do not mean that no work remains for the Gaelic League, or that the Gaelic League is no longer equal to work. I mean that the vital work to be done in the New Ireland will be not so much done by the Gaelic League as by men and movements that have sprung from the Gaelic League, or have received from the Gaelic League a new baptism and a new life of grace. The Gaelic League was no reed shaken by the wind, no mere vox clementis. It was a prophet and more than a prophet, but it was not the Messiah. I do not know if the Messiah has come yet, and I am not sure that there will be any visible or personal Messiah in this redemption. The people itself will perhaps be its own Messiah, the people labouring, scourged, crowned with thorns, agonising and dying to rise again immortal and impassable. For the peoples are divine, and are the only things that can properly be spoken of under the figures drawn from the divine epos. If we do not believe in the divinity of our people, we have had no business, or very little, all these years in the Gaelic League. In fact, if we had not believed in the divinity of our people, we should in all probability not have gone into the Gaelic League at all. We should have made our peace with the devil, and perhaps might have found him a very decent sort for he liberally rewards with attorney generalships, bank balances, villa residences, and so forth, the great and the little who serve him well. Now, we did not turn our backs upon all these desirable things for the sake of Is and Ta. We did it for the sake of Ireland. In other words, we had one and all of us, at least I had, and I hope that all you had, an ulterior motive in joining the Gaelic League. We never meant to be Gaelic Leaguers and nothing more than Gaelic Leaguers. We meant to do something for Ireland, each in his own way. Our Gaelic League time was to be our tutelage. We had first to learn to know Ireland, to read the lineaments of her face, to understand the accents of her voice, to repossess ourselves, disinherited as we were, of her spirit and mind, re-enter into our mystical birthright. For this we went to the school of the Gaelic League. It was a good school, and we love its name, and will champion its fame throughout all the days of our later fighting and striving, but we do not propose to remain schoolboys forever. I have often said, quoting, I think, Herbert Spencer, that education should be a preparation for complete living. And I say now that our Gaelic League education ought to have been a preparation for our complete living as Irish nationalists. In proportion, as we have been faithful and diligent Gaelic Leaguers, our work as Irish nationalists, by which term I mean people who accept the ideal of and work for the realisation of an Irish nation, by whatever means, will be earnest and thorough, a valiant and worthy fighting, not the mere carrying out of a ritual. As to what your work as an Irish nationalist is to be, I cannot conjecture. I know what mine is to be, and would have you know yours and buckle yourself to it. And it may be, nay, it is, that yours and mine will lead us to a common meeting place, and that on a certain day we shall stand together, with many more beside us, ready for a greater adventure than any of us has yet had. A trial and a triumph to be endured and achieved in common. This is what I meant when I said that our work henceforth must be done less and less through the Gaelic League and more and more through groups and through individuals that have arisen or are rising out of the Gaelic League. There will be in the island of the next few years a multitudinous activity of freedom clubs, young Republican parties, labour organisations, socialist groups and whatnot, bewildering enterprises undertaken by sane persons and insane persons, by good men and bad men, many of them seemingly contradictory, some mutually destructive, and yet all tending towards a common objective, and that objective, the Irish Revolution. For if there is one thing that has become plainer than another... It is that when the seven men met in O'Connell Street to found the Gaelic League, they were commencing, had there been a Leon court there to make the epigram, not a revolt, but a revolution. The work of the Gaelic League, its appointed work, was that, and the work is done. To every generation its deed. The deed of the generation that has now reached middle life was the Gaelic League, the beginning of the Irish Revolution. Let our generation not shirk its deed, which is to accomplish the revolution. I believe that the national movement of which the Gaelic League has been the soul has reached the point which O'Connell's movement had reached at the close of the series of monster meetings. Indeed, I believe that our movement reached that point a few years ago, say at the conclusion of the fight for a central Irish, and I had said so at the time. The moment was ripe then for a new young Ireland party, with a forward policy, and we have lost much by our hesitation. I propose in all seriousness that we hesitate no longer, that we push on. 
I propose that we leave Conciliation Hall behind us and go into the Irish Confederation. Whenever Dr Hyde, at a meeting at which I have had a chance of speaking after him, has produced his stuff of peace, I have always been careful to produce my sword, and to tantalise him by saying that the Gaelic League has brought into Ireland not peace but a sword. But this does not show any fundamental difference of outlook between my leader and me. For while he is thinking of peace between brother Irishmen, I am thinking of the sword point between banded Irishmen and the foreign force that occupies Ireland, and his peace is necessary for my war. It is evident that there can be no peace between the body politic and a foreign substance that has intruded itself into its system, between them war only until the foreign substance is expelled or assimilated. Whether home rule means a loosening or a tightening of England's grip upon Ireland remains yet to be seen, but the coming of home rule, if it does come, will make no material difference in the nature of the work that lies before us. It will affect only the means we are to employ, our plan of campaign. There remains, under home rule, as in its absence, the substantial task of achieving the Irish nation. I do not think it is going to be achieved without stress and trial, without suffering and bloodshed. At any rate, it is not going to be achieved without work. Our business here and now is to get ourselves into harness for such work as has to be done. I hold that before we can do any work, any men's work, we must first realise ourselves as men. Whatever comes to Ireland, she needs men. And we of this generation are not in any real sense men, for we suffer things that men do not suffer, and we seek to redress grievances by means which men do not employ. We have, for instance, allowed ourselves to be disarmed. And, now that we have the chance of rearming, we are not seizing it. Professor Owen McNeil pointed out last week that we have at this moment an opportunity of rectifying the capital error we made when we allowed ourselves to be disarmed, and such opportunities, he reminds us, do not always come back to nations. A thing that stands demonstrable is that nationhood is not achieved otherwise than in arms. In one or two instances, there may have been no actual bloodshed, but the arms were there and the ability to use them. Ireland unarmed will attain just as much freedom as it is convenient for England to give her. Ireland armed will attain ultimately just as much freedom as she wants. These are matters which are not concern of the Gaelic League as a body, but they concern every member of the Gaelic League and every man and woman in Ireland. I urged much of this five or six years ago in addresses to the Ard Crave, but the League was too busy with resolutions to think of revolution, and the only resolution a member of the League could not come to was the resolution to be a man. My fellow Leaguers had not, and have not, apprehended that the thing which cannot defend itself, even though it may wear trousers, is no man. I am glad, then, that the North has begun. I am glad that the Orange men have armed, for it is a goodly thing to see arms in Irish hands. I should like to see the AOH armed. I should like to see the transport workers armed. I should like to see any and every body of Irish citizens armed. We must accustom ourselves to the thought of arms, to the sight of arms, to the use of arms. We may make mistakes in the beginning and shoot the wrong people, but bloodshed is a cleansing and sanctifying thing, and the nation which regards it as the final horror has lost its manhood. There are many things more horrible than bloodshed, and slavery is one of them. Chapter 4. The Psychology of a Volunteer. January 1914. McLaurin has challenged my psychology as un-Irish. At least he has challenged as un-Irish the psychology of any man that holds the view that it has not been merely for the sake of saving the Irish language that we leaguers have been working all these years. That is a view that I hold and I have promulgated. Hence I take it there is question here of my psychology. It is a little embarrassing to a shy person to have his psychology discussed in public. One feels inclined to protest indignantly with the old lady the doctor suspected of appendicitis, explaining to her that it meant inflammation of the appendix. Why, I haven't got such a thing! She thought he meant a kind of tale. I really shrink from a public investigation of my psychology. Let me see how Mulgoran would like a very tender examination of his. I formally challenge as not only un-Irish but as diseased the psychology of a man who holds that Parnell's declaration to the people of Connacht that he would not have taken off his coat to the land question but that he saw in it a means to rouse the people of Ireland to assert their right to self-government betrayed the palesman addressing the mere gale and that it was supercilious at that. The declaration in question was one of those four or five illuminating and unforgettable sentences of Parnell's, which prove him to have been the one really great nationalist of his time, the true successor of Tone and Mitchell, though working with such different means. The sentence betrays not the palesman, whatever that may mean, but the Irish nationalist. I hold its nationalism to be authentic, and further, that there is no other nationalism than the nationalism therein implied, that is, that the nation is more important than any part of the nation, 
a national leader in a struggle for self-governance, could not have turned aside from the main issue in order to take up even temporarily any other issue, however important, than the national one, except with the object of strengthening his forces for the main fight, the fight for nationhood. Parnell, as leader of the Irish in their struggle for nationhood, would not have been justified in devoting one hour of his time or one penny of his funds to the land war except as a means to an end. Had Parnell had his way, the land war would not have been fought until the national war had been won, and it is a pity that Parnell had not had his way, as we and our children may realise full soon. I challenge again the Irish psychology of the man who sets up the gale and the palesman as opposing forces with conflicting outlooks. We are all Irish, Leinster reared or Connacht reared. Your native Irish speaker from Evera or Eris is more fully in touch with the spiritual past of Ireland than your Wexfordman or your Kildareman. But your Wexfordman or your Kildareman has other Irish traditions which your Evaraman or your Erisman has lost. It is a great thing to have heard in childhood the songs of a Taig Gaeldoch or to have seen a Raftery or a Colm Wallace. It is an equally great thing to have known old men who fought in Wexford in 98 or have been nursed by a woman who made bullets for the Fenians. All such memories, old and new, are part of Irish history, and he who would segregate Irish history and Irish men into two sections, Irish speaking and English speaking, is not helping towards achieving Ireland a nation. Am I a palesman and is Lord O'Brien of Kilfenora a gale? I propose that in future we reserve the term palesman for those who uphold the domination of the English in Ireland. I propose also that we substitute for the denominations of gale, gall and gall gale the common name of Irishman. I do not know who among us of the Gaelic leaguers that have joined the volunteers has been foolish enough to suggest that he cares for the language merely as a sort of stimulant in the fight for nationhood. Certainly not I. I have spent the best 15 years of my life teaching and working for the idea that the language is an essential part of the nation. I have not modified my attitude in anything that I have recently said or written. I have only confessed, and not for the first time, that in the Gaelic League I have all along been working not for the language merely, but for the nation. I now go further and say that anyone who has been working for the language merely, if there be any such, has never had the true Gaelic League spirit at all, and though in the Gaelic League, has never really been of it. I protest that it was not philology, not folklore, not literature that we went into the Gaelic League to serve, but Ireland a nation. Chapter 5. To the Boys of Ireland. February 1914. We of the Nafira Eren. At the beginning of this year, 1914, a year which is likely to be momentous in the history of this country, address ourselves to the boys of Ireland and invite them to band themselves with us in a nightly service. We believe that the highest thing anyone can do is to serve well and truly. We propose to serve Ireland with all our fealty and with all our strength. Two occasions are spoken of in ancient Irish story, upon which Irish boys marched to the rescue of their country when it was sore beset. Once when Coo Cullen, the boy troop of Ulster, held the frontier until the Ulster heroes rose, and again when the boys of Ireland kept the foreign invaders in check on the shores of Ventry until Fian had rallied the Fianna. It may be that a similar tale shall be told of us, and that when men come to write the history of the freeing of Ireland, they shall have to record that the boys of Nafiana Erin stood in the battle gap until the volunteers armed. We believe, as every Irish boy whose heart has not been corrupted by foreign influence must believe, that our country ought to be free. We do not see why Ireland should allow the English to govern her, either through Englishmen as at present, or through Irishmen under the appearance of self-government. We believe that England has no business in this country at all, that Ireland, from the centre to the zenith, belongs to the Irish. Our forefathers believed this and fought for it. Hugh O'Donnell and Hugh O'Neill and Rory O'Moore and Owen Roe O'Neill, Tone and Emmett and Davis and Mitchell. What was true in their time is still true. Nothing that has happened or that can ever happen can alter the truth of it. Ireland belongs to the Irish. We believe, then, that it is the duty of Irishmen to struggle always, never giving in or growing weary, until they have won back their country again. The object of Nafira Erin is to train the boys of Ireland to fight Ireland's battles when they are men. In the past, the Irish, heroically though they have struggled, have always lost, for want of discipline, for want of military knowledge, for want of plans, for want of leaders. The brave Irish who rose in 98, in 48 and in 67 went down because they were not soldiers. We hope to train Irish boys from their earliest years to be soldiers, not only to know the trade of a soldier, drilling, marching, camping, signalling, scouting, and, when they are old enough, shooting, but also, what is far more important, to understand and prize military discipline and to have a military spirit. Centuries of oppression and of unsuccessful effort have almost extinguished the military spirit of Ireland. If that were once gone, if Ireland were to become a land of contented slaves, 
it would be very hard, perhaps impossible, ever to arouse her again. We believe that Nafina Eren have kept the military spirit alive in Ireland during the past four years, and that if the Fianna had not been founded in 1909, the volunteers of 1913 would never have arisen. In a sense, then, the Fianna have been the pioneers of the volunteers, and it is from the ranks of the Fianna that the volunteers must be recruited. This is a special reason why we should be active during 1914. The Fianna will constitute what the old Irish called the Macrad, or boy troop, of the volunteers and will correspond to what is called in France an école polytechnique, or military school. As the man who was to lead the armies of France to such glorious victories came forth from the military school of Brienne, so may the man who shall lead the Irish volunteers to victory come forth from the Nafian Eren. Our program includes every element of military training. We are not mere boy scouts, although we teach and practice the art of scouting. Physical culture, infantry drill, marching, the routine of camp life, semaphore and more signalling, scouting in all its branches, elementary tactics, ambulance and first aid, swimming, hurling and football, all are included in our scheme of training. An opportunity is given for the older boys for bayonet and rifle practice. This does not exhaust our program, for we believe that mental culture should go hand in hand with physical culture, and we provide instruction in Irish and in Irish history, lectures on historical and literary subjects, and musical and social entertainments as opportunities permit. Finally, we believe with Thomas Davis that righteous men must make our land a nation once again. Hence, we endeavour to train our boys to be pure, truthful, honest, sober, kindly, clean in heart as well as in body, generous in their service to their parents and companions now, as we would have them generous in their service to their country hereafter. We bear a very noble name and inherit very noble traditions, for we are called after the Fianna of Fian, that heroic companionship which, according to legend, flourished in Ireland in the 2nd and 3rd centuries of the Christian era. We, the Fianna, never told a lie. Falsehood was never imputed to us, said O'Shan to St. Patrick. And again when Patrick asked Coelta Macro non how it came that the Fianna won all their battles. Coelta replied, strength that was in our hands, truth that was on our lips, and purity that was in our hearts. Is it too much to hope that after so many centuries, the old ideals are still quick in the hearts of Irish youth, and that this year we shall get many hundreds of Irish boys to come forward and help us build up a brotherhood of young Irishmen, strong of limb, true and pure in tongue and heart, chivalrous, cultured in a really Irish sense, and ready to spend themselves in service to their country? Shinya na fianna Eren. Chapter 6. Why We Want Recruits. May 1915. We want recruits because we have undertaken a service which we believe to be of vital importance to our country, and because that service needs whatever there is of manly stuff in Ireland in order to its effective rendering. We want recruits because we have a standard to rally them to. It is not a new standard, raised for the first time by men of a new generation. It is an old standard, which has been borne by many generations of Irish men, which has gone into many battles, which has looked down upon much glory and much sorrow, which has been assigned to be contradicted, but which shall yet shine as a star. There is no other standard in the world so august as the standard we bear, and it is the only standard which the men of Ireland may bear without abandoning their ancient allegiance. Individual Irishmen may have sometimes fought under other standards, but Ireland as a whole has never fought under any other. We want recruits because we have a faith to give them and a hope with which to inspire them. They are a faith and a hope which have been handed down from generation to generation of Irish men and women unto this last. The faith is that Ireland is one, that Ireland is inviolate, that Ireland is worthy of all love and all homage and all service that may be lawfully paid to any earthly thing, and the hope is that Ireland may be free. In a human sense, we have no desire, no ambition, but the integrity, the honour and the freedom of our native land. We want recruits because we are sure of the righteousness of our cause. We have no misgivings, no self-questionings. While others have been doubting, timorous, ill at ease, we have been serenely at peace with our consciences. The recent time of soul-searching had no terrors for us. We saw our path with absolute clearness. We took it with absolute deliberateness. We could know other. We called upon the names of the great confessors of our national faith, and all was well with us. Whatever soul-searchings there may be among Irish political parties, now or hereafter, we go on in the calm certitude of having done the clear, clean, sheer thing. We have the strength and the peace of mind of those who never compromise. We want recruits because we believe that events are about to place the destiny of Ireland definitely in our hands, and because we want as much help as possible to enable us to bear the burden. 
The political leadership of Ireland is passing to us. Not perhaps to us as individuals, for none of us are ambitious for leadership and few of us are fit for leadership, but to our party, to men of our way of thinking. That is, to the party and to the men that stand by Ireland only. To the party and to the men that stand by the nation. To the party and to the men of one allegiance. We want recruits because we have work for them to do. We do not propose to keep our men idle. We propose to give work to them. Hard work. Plenty of work. We would band together all men capable of working for Ireland and give them men's work. We want recruits because we are able to train them. The great majority of our officers are now fully competent to undertake the training of Irish volunteers for active service under the conditions imposed by the natural and military facts of the map of Ireland. Those officers who are not so competent will be made competent in our training camps during the next few months. We want recruits because we are able to arm them. In a rough way of speaking, we have succeeded already in placing a gun and ammunition, therefore, in the hands of every Irish volunteer that has undertaken to endeavour to pay for them. We are in a position to do as much for every man that joins us. We may not always have the popular pattern of gun, but we undertake to produce a gun of some sort for every genuine Irish volunteer, with some ammunition to boot. Finally, we want recruits because we are absolutely determined to take action the moment action becomes a duty. If a moment comes, as a moment seemed on the point of coming at least twice during the past 18 months, when the Irish volunteers will be justified to their consciences in taking definite military action, such action will be taken. We do not anticipate such a moment in the very near future, but we live at a time when it may come swiftly and terribly. What if conscription is forced upon Ireland? What if a unionist or a coalition British ministry repudiate the Home Rule Act? What if it be determined to dismember Ireland? What if it be attempted to disarm Ireland? The future is big with these and other possibilities, and these are among the reasons why we want recruits.